There was no mistake. The leathery wings, the little horns, the barbed tail, they all were there. The most terrible of all legends had come to life out of the unknown past, yet now it stood, smiling in ebon majesty. With the sunlight gleaming upon its tremendous body, and with a human child resting trustfully in either arm. Welcome to Afraid of the Dark. Welcome back to a cardboard box floating down the river. I'm your host, Alex, and I'm with my girlfriend, Carly, here. Hi. And you're listening to Afraid of the Dark, and it's our first episode today. So we're going to be talking about the Mothman, but there's some housekeeping things that I wanted to go over first. Um, we have an Instagram. It's at AOTDPOD, uh, Afraid of the Dark Pod. That's an acronym for Afraid of the Dark Podcast. Um, our YouTube is Afraid of the Dark Podcast, and that's where we'll be uploading full videos, maybe with a little sound wave, little sound wave, little special effect kind of thing. Do you know what I'm talking about? No. Little sound wave, like that bounces when we talk, like the, like the audacity oh. thing. Maybe Candle will have that. Um, we plan to release new t episodes every other Tuesday, but we have a few, um, special ideas, like, uh like side things, little smaller things that might release in between every one of those things. And I want to give a special thanks to Carly, since it's her first episode, for, for putting up with all the stupid shit I do and always supporting me no matter what. Thank you. And John, at E-X-I-L-L-U-S-L-O-P-E-S, -L -L -E Exilus Lopes on Instagram, for all of our wonderful art. Um, he is amazing. Please check him out. And since, don't look at my script, you little fucker. So this is, since, oh... Since this is our first episode, I do want to go over some... I said housekeeping things already, didn't I? Yeah. Well, we're going to go over some housekeeping things. Um, since we're talking about cryptozoology and things that are kind of wooey, I want to firmly say that this is pseudoscience. We don't believe this to be true. Um, we're not saying this is true. I'm simply discussing it with Carly, and um, we're just having fun with it. Because at the end of the day, there's stories. And I don't, you know, this is just for, for legal purposes. Don't talk to anybody. If you, like, listen to us and you say, oh, let me, let me, let me talk to, let me find a Woodrow Derringer's great-grandson and harass him on Twitter. Don't do that. And especially keep our name out of it. Okay. Keep my name out of it. You're, you can mention Carly. You're being very aggressive. I'm not being aggressive. This is a brief intro to my role. I haven't, I do enjoy the supernatural and the paranormal. I know a good kind of bit about of it, but Alex is going to be telling me stories and I'm going to be reacting to them. And he wants my input because I have a kind of scientific brain and I have a degree. Yeah, you could say that. Okay. I have a degree in biological sciences and anthropology. I'm not an expert, not saying I am, but I think I have a yeah, good Yeah, just grasp. to interrupt, I don't have a degree in anything. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I don't have a degree in anything. Um, but that is, I've always, and we're, this is up our next point here. Um, well, let's let's go through one more thing. Um, the ratings of the show, I do want to keep it PG thirteen, not including swearing. Um, but some of these stories do involve talking about minor violence, things, nothing, nothing crazy. And regardless of what we talk about, if there's a serious topic, we're gonna say that say that it's serious beforehand. You know, like in a few episodes, we're gonna be we're gonna be talking about animal mutilation and. Um, you know, that's, that's kind of a gross topic, especially at the part of the body that is being mutilated. But Animals? Yeah. Animal mutilation. Well, it's sad. It is sad. But, you know, um, some of these stories, if I read quotes, uh, they're also written a long time ago, and they use language that is not appropriate for current times. So I, will be qu I might be quoting that, and I will be changing some words. Um, so it's not a direct quote. So you're going to paraphrase. I'm paraphrasing, yep. but using correct... 2022 terminology that is respectful to everybody and no worse swear words in the word fuck that's where i draw the line what no worse swear words than the word fuck what worse swear words are there the, the c word okay 
Which isn't really... Oh, you're not a woman, so you can't speak. Okay, that. whatever. Um, I want to introduce myself again, since this is the first episode. Um, I've always had a thing for the supernatural. I love it. I wouldn't say I'm <laughs> psychically inclined, but um, don't make that face. Maybe psychotically inclined. <laughs> That's that was lame. Um, but I do enjoy the supernatural. I always have, and I always will. I love these stories. I listen to podcasts all the time um, about these things. And I just, you know, I love them. And Carly is the same way, except Carly, like I, like she said before, has a very scientific, we'll call it scientific way of, of looking at things. Um, where you're going to find out that I'm more c- creative-minded. I'm, and I'm creative, you're creative. I'm grounded, I'm grounded in like, Science. reality. And these things aren't grounded in reality. <laughs> so they don't exist. I'm not saying that's not, that's why. I, it, it, like we said before, I don't believe that any of this is hard fact, you know. We're going to be talking about the Mothman, and there's a bunch of different shit involved with the Mothman. There's aliens, there's men in black, there's Mothmen, Mothman, not multiple. I don't think there's multiple, there might be though. Why don't we get into it? So we're not well, no, 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 I wanted to talk about, this is the first episode, it's introductory, I wanted to ask you about your opinions on some of the supernatural phenomena, because I know that you have different opinions on different things. Okay. I wanted to know about um, what do your like? What do you think about ghosts and spirits? This is hard. We're also going to be keeping this as non-religious as possible. Well, I'm not religious. Neither of us are religious. I'm agnostic, which just means that you're uh, annoying. That was really funny. <laughs> Um, I'm agnostic, so that means that, like, something could be out there. I don't really know. I don't know with ghosts. It's, like, weird because I've had really weird experiences, but I also know that the brain has, like, kind of trained us to be more susceptible to weird experiences, which I will probably be discussing during the show. Um, I'm kind of up in the air. But, honestly, I have a deep respect for anything that's dead, so I won't... She does. Yeah. I... Um. I don't think you should disrespect anyone that's dead. Because you think that they're still alive somehow. No, I think I have a deep respect for people in life. So even after they're gone, I think you should respect them. Okay. And what do you think about aliens? They're, aliens in the in the in the common cultural sense. Yeah, they're not little green guys. Neil deGrasse Tyson, um, he has a podcast, and I remember him talking about how the human brain, if there are aliens. They're just not fathomable. Oh, interesting. To us. So you agree with that? That they're not like you, the human brain can't fathom them. Yeah, it makes sense because the way that the Earth is created in in our universe, I do believe that there's more than one universe. Huh. Because that's science. I didn't know <laughs> quantum physics. I didn't know that she thought that way. Yeah. Um. So because if there's more than one universe and it's created in different ways and does it may not have all the same elements that we do. I think it would yield very different results in terms of maybe like humanoid figures, but in terms of like aliens, I think the most reasonable route is probably through like stromatolites, which is um, microbial mats or bacteria. So you think in the common cultural sense, little green men flying flying saucers in the air isn't real? No. You don't think that exists? No. Okay. What about like Bigfoot? Definitely not. We both agree Bigfoot is bullshit. Yeah. Bigfoot is the most bullshit common cryptid there is. I'm a big Bigfoot hater. I wouldn't say hater. The only thing I like is the iCarly episode. I don't remember that. <laughs> it was funny. They hunt Bigfoot? Yeah. I'll also, my friend, my buddy Jim said, there's 20 seasons of hunting Bigfoot and they still haven't found him. He's not fucking real. Yeah. It's like the Curse of Oak Island. Bullshit. I guess... The only, like, counter-argument that I have is that, like, there's still a lot of species, even oh, yeah. animal species, that are undocumented. You could say that about everything we're going to talk but about. But he's a, he's a pretty big dude. Got big feet. Well, I can't... It could be a woman. I don't know. The, also, because it would essentially be, like, a primate, it would probably live in a pack or, like, a group. That's why I think Bigfoot is bullshit. Yeah. You know? Or Bigfoot is an alien. No. Why would it come? Why this is okay? The whole, we're gonna talk about okay. that later. We're okay. gonna talk about that later. 
So today we're going to get into today's story. What do you know? And this audience, um, I'm going to be honest with you, this is not the first time we're recording this. This is, and I have talked about Carly, to Carly about this story before, because I really enjoy the story of Mothman, and more specifically Point Pleasant in 1966. But what do you know about this story? Um, and be honest, because we, we have filmed this before. We yeah. filmed part of it. We filmed about half an hour of this, and then just fucking threw it all out because it sucked. Yeah. So, I listened to a podcast. I tried to listen to it. Maybe got like 45 minutes in. Not what hours. Podcast? Astonishing, uh, uh, Astonishing yeah. Legends. Okay. It was just boring. The only, the, honestly, I don't listen to a lot of cryptid specials. I only listen to like ghosts or like true crime. So. So, you know, there's a Mothman. Yeah, there's a Mothman. There's something to do with conjunctivitis. Um, it takes place in Point Pleasant. There was a bridge. And I think some teenagers were like making out in like these old war They always things. do. War? Okay, yeah, yeah. okay. I remember, right. like, this war right. stuff. Let's get into it. First, we're going to talk about the author, John Keel. John Keel um, was just just a guy. He joined the military. He was a military radio broadcaster. He decided that he really liked broadcasting and journalism and stuff. He worked in Paris, Berlin, Rome, Egypt. He's a traveled guy. Um, he was a journalist, and one of his, I think, the funniest title that he um, published was Are You a Repressed Sex Fiend? In no, the 60s. I'm not. I'm not asking you. I was John Keel asking you. I know. Um, so he's obviously, you know, he had to have published this in the 60s. I tried to find the article. I couldn't find it anywhere. The Are You a Repressed Turns sex out fiend? Googling Are You a Repressed Sex Fiend does not yield. John, did you read his, the yeah, author? Yeah, I did. Oh, I couldn't find it. Weird. If anyone finds it, um, send it to me on Instagram. In 1957, he published his first occult book called Jadu, which was about Indian magic tricks and the Yeti. Again, one of... Actually, the Yeti is more believable than Bigfoot because those mountains are scary. But what would he eat? I don't know. There's things that live in those places. It's fucking barren wasteland, Nepal, near Mount Everest. That's where the Yeti's from. He was always interested in UFOs, UFOlogy, ufology, however you pronounce it. He And he tried to... Imp- uh, use a scientific method in in trying to determine where and when these things might happen. He used the time of day, like the phase of moon, day of the week, the atmospheric conditions, the humidity, temperature, all that stuff. And UFO flaps, he studied, which is a word we're probably going to come back to, which are basically, UFOs come in packs. They don't usually come one at a time. And especially during the 40s, 50s, 60s, or, yeah, 40s, 50s, 60s, and then the um, early 70s there's a ton of UFOs all the time in America and everywhere else in the world I just feel like people are bored they might have been bored but there's things like Roswell it was a cultural that time was a crazy with technology right after World War II they and used all that World War II military technology captured Nazi scientists everything you could think of they were trying to do laser beams microwaves nuclear radiation that shit's crazy Later in life, obviously, now we're talking about him, he became a world-renowned parapsychologist and ufologist with a guy named Gray Barker, which was one of his frenemies that we'll be talking about too, who also wrote a book on the Mothman, which I did not read. Um, And John Keel is most famous, not most famous, but one of his crowning achievements is coining the term men in black. Not coining it, but popularizing it. And about the book, Mothman Prophecies, which is the book. I don't know if I said that already. Mothman Prophecies. It is a fun, fun read. I have it, Carly. You can read it if you want, but no, I'm sure okay. you don't want to. Yep. Um, it got about halfway through, though, it gets off topic. And it doesn't talk about the Mothman anymore. Well, it does, but not to the extent which I would have liked it to. Did you but do now, more research outside of the book? I did, but the problem is when you Google Mothman, you're just going to find fucking Fallout 76 guides and loonies someone i gotta teach you how to do research i know how to do research you go to jstor you go to penis and you look up (laughs) all right what do you know about silver bridge a lot of people died how many like thousands no i thought thousands no wait (laughs) that wouldn't make sense 23 no you're that's half 
Forty, forty-six. Yeah, 46 oh, in my mind, I had twenty-three thousand, which in hindsight doesn't make sense. That's more than people who lived in the town. <laughs> yeah, isn't it like six thousand? Yeah. Okay. So, um, on December fifteenth, nineteen sixty-seven, at five o five p.m., the Silver Bridge, which is an I-bar suspension bridge, and I looked it up. It's called I-bar because there's a little I in the center of it at the top. It's just your standard suspension bridge. Um, collapsed and plunged 46 people into the icy Ohio River who died 10 days before Christmas. It was tragic. But there was a lot of things that happened before that event. I'm not saying that they caused the event, but there was a lot of things that happened prior, specifically exactly 13 months prior. 13 months. 13. You know that's a biblical number? There's an M on the can. Flip oh it over. Gosh. Hebrew. 666. 13 months. It is weird. Okay. That's weird number one. I don't think... That's... Exactly 13 months. Okay. It's probably a coincidence. And people only attribute it like as it being, you know, it's a biblical number. So we're going to talk about the first sighting of the Mothman. Early November. Hold up. Why did you start at the end? Because I wanted to give context. Okay. So... A bridge broke. The silver bridge collapsed. Yeah. A bunch <clears throat> of people died. And everyone before that had, that entire year, 1966 to 67, a bunch of weird shit was going on in Point Pleasant. Okay. So we started at the end to give context. Yeah. And right after the bridge collapsed, weird stopped. Okay. No more weird. So you can't test that scientifically, but pre-bridge, weird. Post-bridge, not a lot of weird, except for those the local West Virginians who are a little funky. First sighting of the Mothman. And this is pretty tame. National Guardsman, there was a National Guardsman post outside of Point Pleasant, just outside. Um, he looked up in the tree. He's just on his post. It's nighttime. He looks up in the tree and he sees this massive fucking thing in the tree. He's like, what is that? What is that? It can't be a bird. And he just stares at it for a while. Nothing really happens. He stares at it for a while. And then he leaves. Go get some of his buddies. Say, hey, come look at this shit. He comes back. It's gone. That's the story. Okay. And, you know, some shit like that would have gone under the, um, you know. People, I see things, all weird things all the time. You know. I look in the mirror. <laughs> okay. Editor, add crickets. I'm the editor. Add crickets, Alex. That's the weird. That's the first sighting of the Mothman reported on West Virginia's website. But, like, how do they attribute They don't. So they, they said it was bigger than a guy him. sitting in a tree. But it was nighttime. That's it. That, it was nighttime. So You're right. his eyes could have been playing tricks on him. You're absolutely correct. What Point Pleasant was like. 6,000 people, and this is what we made a point before. This is the one point I actually liked making in our previous recording of this podcast. 6,000 people, 22 churches, and zero bars. For reference, we live on a college campus, an unnamed college campus in the Northeast, and there are probably, what, do you, what would you say, 20,000 students here? Yeah. And there are... There's probably like six churches. Six churches. But all of different faiths. Yeah. There's one church for each, each major, you know... There are 6,000 people in this town. There are 22 churches. There are no bars. People do not have fun. In no darties. No fucking darties. Are you kidding me? John Keel said when he arrived in the town, he thought it was clean. It's, it's well managed. It's prosperous. It's not your typical 60s coal mining Appalachian town, as a lot of towns in West Virginia were. It's just your standard run-of-the-mill Boring, Christian, fucking lame town. You could say the same thing about ours, so. Yeah, you absolutely. And most of where we live is just the fucking woods anyway. In this town, there's a woman named Mary Heyer. She was the reporter for the Ohio's Athens Messenger. She's trustworthy. Everyone loved her. If something was wrong, you go to Mary. She put it in the paper and people would help you out. You want a job application? Mary will help you out. If you, if you see some ghosties, Mary Heyer is going to tell you to fuck off. But someone bursts into Mary Heyer's office. This is November 2nd, 1966. Someone bursts in. She, and the guy, oh, he doesn't burst in. That was an exaggeration on my part. 
He calls Mary higher up. He says, I just, Mary, I just got to tell somebody some of this. Mary says that she, he sounds nervous, but he sounds sincere about it. You know, like he's shaken. And you know what? To circle back, a lot of this is based on faith. You have to, you have to, to, to imagine that these people, and I'm asking Carly and I'm asking you audience that you have to just kindly, what's it called? Suspension of disbelief okay. with this stuff. You have to just believe that this, what John Keel wrote and what Mary Heyer told John Keel was accurate. She said that he sounded nervous but sincere. So he was shaken about this. He says, I just have to tell somebody. He said he was driving home from work one day and a big tubular spaceship zoomed over his head, went right in front of his car and slowed his car down. So it, it went in front of his car to make him step on the brakes intentionally to slow his car down to a stop. Do you have something to say? Mm, keep going. Okay. So, a door swung open. A man got out. He said his hands were crossed into his with his palms facing his armpits like this. Audience, you can't see. But it's a weird way to cross your arms, right? Okay. It's not a natural way to cross your arms. It was like that movie with that girl. She's like superstar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so he had a large, unnatural grin on his face, like a fucking clown. Uh huh. He told him to roll down the window. He asked what his name was, where he's from, where he's going, and what time it was. And the guy answered all of his questions. And he said, "Thank you." He got back in his ship, and it took off. He said that he went home that night. And he was just stricken with insomnia and nightmares about the whole thing. Even though nothing really bad had happened. He just couldn't sleep. He didn't couldn't do anything about it. And a few days later, for no reason, his uh, the guy's son called Mary Heyer and told him not to publish the story. And then just sat in, uh, sat in a folder at Mary Heyer's desk for a couple of years. Not a year. Maybe a year. John Keel, Mary Heyer, told this guy, or told John, that this had happened and John Keel finally got to call the person and he's like, why did you say not to publish the story? He said because a, a, some unnamed scientist had come up to him or called him on the phone or something and said that he kind of like asked him about what happened and said, well, it would be better if you just forgot about it. You know, when people say that to you mm -hmm. in like a passive aggressive kind of way. Sure. And then that's why he didn't want the story published. So John said, can I publish the story? I'm not going to use your name or anything. So the, this guy doesn't have a name. The first the first person this happened to. Let's name him Bill. Billy. That's a West Virginia name. So let me ask you, Carly. Yep. How did this person know that this happened to him without him publishing in the story? The researcher? The, no. What are you talking about? Who, well, I don't understand. How, how, okay, so the scientist came up to this guy telling him that he should forget that this happened. Oh, yeah, the scientist. So how did the scientist know? I mean, how do we know that the scientist knows? This is all hearsay. Hearsay. Suspend Johnny, disbelief. Johnny Depp and Amber Heard's child. Uh, all for JD. Suspend disbelief. How would the, how would the scientist know that that happened? It wasn't published. No one knew about it. I don't. You don't know. Yeah, but the scientist is a human. Like, Is he? Oh, my gosh. Okay. No. But Shh. <laughs> you can't suspend disbelief if you're trying to talk about, like, real life. There's no suspension of disbelief. Suspension okay, of disbelief Okay, well, I'm, that's not movies. suspension of disbelief. It's you have to believe that what they're saying is, is true. Okay. That's what I'm asking you I'm to do. I'm kind of not... On that train right now, but we'll see what happens. <sighs> Woody Derringer was a reputable man. He was a um, sewing machine salesman. He lived a rather mundane life. He was in his late 50s. He was coming home from work one day, 7 p.m., November 2nd. He was coming home from work. And a car, black Cadillac, sped past him, and following that Cadillac was a long, tubular, what looked like to be a ship. It stopped in front of his car, or it allowed him to stop, come to a complete stop safely. Um, 
he kind of waited outside of his car, like he pulled over to the side of the road to try to get past it, but it was just he couldn't. It was he was going to drive off the road into into a crevasse, into a chasm. And out stepped a man, massive, huge grin on his face, palms to his armpits. And what he said, he didn't hear an audible voice. He just he had a feeling like the, he knew what the man wanted. He wanted him to roll his window down. So he says, Do, the, um, this man is thinking to Woody right now. He's thinking. He's not moving his mouth. He's speaking to Woody through his brain. He says, do not be, af do not be afraid. We mean you no harm. We come from a country much less powerful than yours. They exchange names. Woody, the man told Woody that his name was Cold. Cold pointed to the lights in the distance, and he asked, what is that? Referring to a city in the distance. I think it was Parkersburg, West Virginia. And Woody said, that's a city. You know, there's shops and, and food and restaurants there. And Cold said that where he's from, those places are called gatherings. And Woody said he looked up, and the ship was still in the air. Cars were now passing by. So car passerby just saw a guy talking to a car on the side of the road. But this guy's ship was 50 feet in the air. It was just floating there. And then the ship came back down. Cold got back in the ship and said, we will see you later. And the door shut. The guy took off. Did you notice anything about the dates? November. November 2nd, right? Yep. It was the same night as that other story. Okay. So you have two people, same night, both saying the same thing. Okay. And... You have to realize what time of time that this was. This was 1966. So it's not like the culture of today where we are more scientific, scientifically, sci-fi, sci sci-fi is what? Science fiction. Yeah. Inclined than, than they are. Especially a guy who's 50 in West Virginia is not going to know how to make up these stories. He's going to say a little man, green man, and little silver spaceship came down he abducted me abducted my cows so two people in the same night said the same thing okay a little strange is it not i mean maybe it's a small town though people talk. it is a small people do talk these people are not from the same area though they're traveling along the same road they're not from the same town they're both traveling workers I... stumped you didn't i you're not stumping me, but... That's strange. It's strange, but I don't know, like... The story is coming from John Keel, right? The story is coming directly... This is the guy, remember I told you there was an interview? Yeah. This was the guy. Who they interviewed. Woody? Woody. Then... I don't know. You have two people saying the same thing who don't know each other. Uh, but this is, this is, the thing is, you have to take a lot of assumptions in order to prove a point. You know what I mean? I, that's, that, but that's what this is. That's the point of this show. I'm not... You have to, you have to just take what these, obviously, you, that's why we said at the top of the show that none of this is real. This is, this is, complete. you have to take what John Keel writes and what, what these people are saying. Well, as fact you wanted me here because i'm a science person and i'm pointing out you need you have to make a lot of assumptions in order i'm gonna okay so there's two different types of research and it's qualitative and quantitative so qualitative research is usually things like interviews and studies or sorry and surveys um and you do take people's words as empirical evidence so i don't want to say that using people's words is not proving or being evidence of something, but those studies are highly controlled and you have, you know what I mean? You know who someone's talking no, to. No, I, I understand what you're saying. I'm just, I'm asking you to believe this. I'm asking the audience to believe this. Okay. I'm I, saying, imagine that this is real. You have two people saying the same thing happened on the same night. They're both men from 1960 who don't have any sort of creative ability with this kind of but shit. But you, you're assuming that. I am assuming that. You're absolutely right. But I feel like I'm assuming accurately. No, I don't think so. There was radio shows and books. A 50s man who's who's near a town 
where there's 22 churches is not going to have anything to do with aliens. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. November 14th, 1966. This story is from Gray Barker, who we mentioned before, who's also a world-famous parapsychologist and ufologist. I will be using the words UFOologist and ufologist as I see fit, because I think ufologist is funny. Interchangeably. Interchangeably. He's one of Kiel's frenemies. They know each other. They were kind of like, you know, ha, ha, ha. I'm going to write this story first. And they, like, kissed each other. So this has to do with a guy who has a dog named Bandit. It's a big German shepherd. And about 1030 that night, um, Bandit's owner, Newell Partridge, was watching TV when it went out. He said he heard a noise outside, and it's similar to the sound of a generator starting up. So it's kind of like, you know, kind of like that. Yep. That was a sound effect. <laughs> he said Bandit started howling at his hay barn that he had outside. So that um, he grabbed, uh, got up, he grabbed a flashlight. He's like, all right, there's probably a, a, a bear out there. He went outside to investigate. He shined the light at the barn in the direction that the dog was howling, and then he said that he saw two giant red, what he thought, eyes, that were eyes, because they had that reflective property. You know when you take a picture of a dog and it has that kind of shine to it, yep. their eyes? He said he saw that, but he was 150 yards away, so it's like farther than that building. We're kind of like on a balcony. Farther than that building away, he saw two giant red things. He said he'd be hunting all his life. He hunts in the dark. This guy is no fucking joke. Hunts in the dark, and they looked giant. No, looked like nothing that he'd ever seen before. So Bandit must have seen that, seen the eyes after he shined the light, and Bandit darted into the woods. And this is important, what I'm about to say. Newell was about to chase after his dog, but he, he took a step, and he just felt this, this freezing fear over his body. He could not, he loved that dog. It was his best friend. And he did not want it. He could not, not did not, he could not take another step because he was so scared. It was a paralyzing fear. Mm -hmm. He went back in the, he went back to sleep in quotations, quotations, and he slept with a shotgun in his Since bed that night. When was that a quotation sound effect? I have never heard that. Quotations. The next day he got back up to look for the dog. And he said that the, he found tracks because it was a big fucking German Shepherd. He found tracks, but it looked like Bandit was chasing his tail in the mud, which is not something that Bandit did or would do in that situation. And then it was gone, like something had lifted him off the ground. And this is a quote. I think the hardest thing to explain is the feeling involved, except to say that it was an eerie feeling. I had never had this sort of feeling before. It was as if you knew something was wrong, but just couldn't place what it was. Sounds like anxiety. It is anxiety. Yeah. But it's, and I've talked to you about this before in our personal conversations. You know when you see something scary and you just get this freezing feeling over your body? Yeah. I know. It's it's something that you can't explain. I don't know if there's a word for it. Dread I maybe? feel like that on a daily basis. No, but it's like freezing, like I felt there. Remember the day I was driving home and I yeah, texted you I, I saw something on the side of the road? I didn't want to hear about it. I don't know what it was. But I just felt so scared for no reason. And this is what we're going to get into. I think, well, I'll save my theories for the end of the video. Sorry that this sounds kind of bad. Carly had a Carly had a little itchy and then she knocked the mic over. In Point Pleasant... There were these, um, what they, the locals called igloos, and in the TNT area is what they, they, they lovingly referred to it as. It's where they manufactured and stored explosives during World War II. So what they did was they built big concrete igloos in the forest, and they coated them with, like, moss and, like, camouflage. So if a plane was flying overhead, they would be able to see it. But now it's the 60s, it's 20, 20 years after World War II. And now that you just see big stone fucking circles in the ground. So it looks a little weird. It looks a little off-putting. And while you're not supposed to be there, um, it's not guarded. You know, there's a fence outside that says, keep out, you little naughty boys. But no one's really, there's no, there's light police guarding it. Are there, like, explosives? 
No, after World War II, there are both. Okay. That's what they think. Then why do they care? Do they use any nuclear stuff? No, that wasn't. That wasn't where they would have done it. Toxic waste. There might be in manufacturing explosives. You're gonna have toxic, you know. Yeah, I don't know much about that. Sulfurs and and gunpowders and shit like that. So here's your couple kissing. Two couples, total of four people. They're looking for something to do. There's no bars in the town, so they're just gonna go fucking play can jam. I mean, that's what down we the do. Street, drive around and go to fucking Target. They're driving around. They're just outside of the TNT area, and the front passenger gasps. She, the driver hits the brakes, understandably, and everyone looks for it. And they see, in the light of the car, they see two giant red eyes. And they drove up a little bit, and the light hit the creature, and they saw. They said it was maybe six, six and a half to seven feet fall, with massive wings that were folded up against his back. And the most notable thing by far was the eyes. That was what was predominantly they saw. And they saw a little fucking man, not a little man, six and a half feet, seven feet tall, not a little man, and wings folded up against his back. They said they began to back up. They put the car in reverse, and the fucking thing started to chase him. They said it unfolded its wings and shot straight up in the air. It did not flap its wings, and that's an important distinction. It did not flap its wings. Blew into the air. They said it squealed like a mouse. So it's like, wee, 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 and it goes whoosh and shoots up into the air. Um, and it followed them in their car. They're driving. It kept up with them. They're probably hitting fucking 60 in their, in their 60s car. I don't know anything about cars, but I'm assuming 60 is like top speed for a 1960s standard issue car. And it followed them right to the, the city limits. This is a minor thing. They saw a dead dog on the way in. And when they came back the next day, that dog was that dog was gone. That's a little thing. Maybe the Mothman likes to eat dogs. Throwbacks to the previous story. Or, or I'm gonna go on to the next point. They ran right to the police, and the police, being in a small town, they know everybody in there. It's like Stranger Things, and um, the police said that these kids were not troublemakers. They were just teenagers. They said that they were generally trustworthy. And they were undeniably terrified. You know when someone's making shit up? You can tell when someone's making shit up. I'm they not... saw they saw something. Be it a Mothman, be it not a Mothman, they saw something that scared the shit out of these kids that night. Police told the reporters, paper hit the press, and the name was born. Point Pleasant now had the Mothman. What were you going to say? About the dog? They were in the woods, right? No, and yeah, you're right. That's, there's animals in the woods. Just, that was just a notable thing. Mothman ate Bandit. Mothman may have eaten this dog. Does Mothman need to eat? I mean, most of these instances happened at night. Yeah. You're right. So we're just going to exclude 12 hours of the day out of no evidence collection? At, first of all, your eyes are really not accurate at night. They're not. Your memory, also, highly inaccurate. And humans are predisposed to detect or over-detect things that they think are meaningful or have faces or have what human in nature figures. is going to give you two perfectly okay, symmetrical how about this? giant red bicycle? How reflectors? about this? A lady thought she saw the Virgin Mary on toast, and if these things that happen, that bitch was insane. You see shapes in the cloud, right? In shapes and clouds? Yeah, but I don't see fucking bicycle reflectors in the clouds. I think what happens is, is that when people, you can feel genuine fear and like you can genuinely believe that you see something. I'm not discounting that they're, they were terrified or that they think that they saw something, but your adrenaline's pumping, you're really and I scared. Can, I understand. That, well, I don't know. I understand, but... Again, I know you're going to say, I know your response is going to be, it's a small town. Yeah. You have people seeing, who do not know each other, seeing the same thing. You're assuming they don't know each other. <laughs> yeah, I am assuming that they don't know each other. But I'm pretty sure four teenagers don't know fucking Newell Partridge. So, story hit the press. There's nothing to do, like I said, 6,000 people, 22 churches, zero bars. 
put a gun in my mouth. Nothing to do in Point Pleasant. So everyone was trying to look for this guy. Everyone was trying to look for the Mothman. And now there were people who said that they saw the Mothman. And there was people who saw the Mothman in italics. <laughs> Quote noise. You understand that? There was people who said they saw the Mothman and there was yeah. people who saw the Mothman. Yeah. The presumably. Presumably saw the Mothman. People, everyone who said they saw it was always visibly terrified. They were shaken. And people who said they saw the Mothman were not. They're like, oh my god, I saw the, the, the big beast outside my gate. What if it was like this random dude that was just bored? He, sh- he shot into the fucking air? <laughs> I don't know. Vertically? <laughs> Maybe he had, like, a pulley system. And this is interesting. This is a nice bit of 60s fun fact. Keel, John Keel, said in his book, quote, It seemed to have a penchant for scaring females who were menstruating. Another UFO slash hairy monster peculiarity. How did he know that they were I don't know. Menstruating? John Keel, audience, had a habit of describing women... In excruciating detail in this book. Mm. From an elderly man. Quote, he stepped out to his front lawn to see why his dog was barking, and he confronted a six to seven foot tall gray apparition with flaming eyes. He stood transfixed for several mo- moments, unaware of the passage of time. Suddenly the creature flew off, and he staggered back into his house. His wife said that he was so pale and shaken, she thought he was having a heart. Another citizen was spending time with her child. She said she looked out the window and she said something that looked like it had been lying down in her yard. It rose up slowly from the ground. A big gray thing, bigger than a man, with terrible glowing red eyes. She whimpered and froze, dropping the child that she was holding in her arms. The baby began to cry because it hit the ground and she dropped the fucking baby. And she did not pick the baby up. She was transfixed on this thing in her yard. She said that she could not move. She said, quote, She was hypnotized by the blazing red circles on top of the towering, headless creature. Its great wings slowly unfolded and took off. And people were just flooding. Not only Woody's house, but the TNT area to try to kill this grinning man and the moth. Okay. What do you? What would you see in your yard that would make you drop your kid? Um, probably a lot of things, like a bear. You would drop your kid? I don't know. For a bear? I don't have a kid. Maybe like, whoa. And, and not even she dropped it by accident. Went to go pick it up. She dropped it, and stared at this thing. Every person said they stared at this thing for a couple seconds before they could do anything. They stared at these eyes like they were hypnotized. You know, like, lead paint was, like, a big thing? No, you're right. Lead paint, that's why they say a lot of serial killers were during this time. was because of lead paint. You're right. I also, it's just weird that all of these events occurred, like, occurred and then stopped. You think it was, like, mass hysteria, like the witch trials? It could have been, but my point is always going to go back to you. You have different people who didn't know each other seeing things at the same time. And yes, I'm assuming it. uh, You're assuming. I am assuming Also, Also, why is it like this really scary thing that everyone was afraid of and like now it's a novelty? That's how things are. People were fucking scared of serial killers and now there's shows on Netflix. Yeah. You're talking about leaf killers and fuck. For context, I'm listening to a new crime, true crime podcast. I don't want to discount anybody's stories or their feelings or make it seem like I don't trust people. I just, I don't know. I find it really hard to believe, but I'm validating all of their feelings and what they felt and stuff like that. I just think that sometimes things just don't add up and I know a lot of crazy things happen in the world all the time and there's really not a reason for stuff it just this seems not you know achievable in the laws of our world why what do you mean why why what doesn't seem achievable I just feel why would an alien come here and then just go away and we never hear about this again like 
John, we're going to talk about that. Let's let's save our theories for later. I know I asked you why, but we'll, we'll save our theories for later. So we're going to talk about, we're going to go back to Woody. He was gaining notoriety, obviously, because the story was published. Um, and he was in contact with the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomenon, known as NICAP, which is one of the many, many UFO companies, I'm going to say not companies, organizations that are going to be talked about in the show, I'm sure. Um, and they urged him not to tell any more people about what he experienced. Just shut up. And he said he, his house looked like the TNT area, much as this may, because there was just people fucking everywhere and he hated it. He said one day he was in his house and he was kind of sick. He wasn't feeling too well. He said a black, black Volkswagen drove up, parked, and a tan man in a black suit got out. He and Woody talked a little bit. And after a few minutes, the black the man got back into his VW and drove off. The great hunters, Keel said, referring to the people who were trying to kill cold, continued to sit in the cold behind the trees and their eyes towards the sky. They're looking for this guy. They want to shoot him down. Gordon Derenberger, he'd been looking, he'd been suffering from a stomach ailment for quite a while, and Mr. Cold had given him a vial of medicine that he claimed. He claimed cured him instantly. He took a sip. He was fine. Derringer said that he, the um, Colt now had a first name, and he said it was Indrid. So Indrid, C-O-L-D. And this is something interesting. Later, NICAP urged Woody to get a psycho psychological evaluation mm -hmm. to solidify his statements, and he did, and the outcome that he was perfectly normal. That, but that's by 60s, yeah. That is by 60s psychological standards, which were notoriously bad, yeah. But, but he came, it came out, came back by that time only. And there's another thing, um, cold in this story is spelled C O L D. And John Keel, I don't have the exact quote, but had mentioned that the, the spelling K U L D had come from somewhere that was like mentioned to Woody that it was spelled K-U-L-D and he wouldn't know why anyone would say that to him. So that's just another peculiarity on top of the story. Sounds like people aren't tying up their loose ends. These fucking aliens are running around. So, I want to get um, some facts about Mothman. Facts. <laughs> Okay. Facts. All right. People describe him as being, all of the accounts say the same thing, six to seven feet tall. He has giant bat wings. He's gray. He has a human body. He's got thick, muscular legs. The guy squats 405. When people see him, they have a feeling of absolute pure terror. Pure, freezing terror. They describe his eyes. Listen as being flaming, reflective, hypnotizing, like a car or bicycle reflector. Um, he squeaks like a mouse. He takes off straight into the air. There's quotes, he took off straight like a helicopter, did not flap his wings. This is a quote, aerodynamically Mothman was ill-suited for flight. A creature larger than a big man and therefore weighing in excess of 200 pounds would require way more than a 10-foot wingspan to get aloft. And large birds take off by running along the ground and flapping their wings. Mothman shoots into the air like a helicopter. And I did some research, okay? Yeah. I googled. The largest bird wingspan is the wandering albatross with a wingspan of 12.1 feet and weighs 16 pounds. And the heaviest bird is called the Great Bustard, and it weighs 35 pounds with a wingspan of 8 feet. Does it fly? Yeah. So he's Superman? And I left a quote out intentionally. He appears to, he, people, multiple people have said that he's headless because all they could see is his eyes. He has no notable face. There's a lot of things that show him with like big gnarly teeth. But no, no one ever mentions his teeth. In fact, they say he looks headless, like it's a shoulders and then two big fucking eyes. So here's when Keel actually joins the party. Yep. 
Keel is now going. He was in a UFO convention in Georgia. And he's coming back up from. Don't laugh. He's in a. He was coming up, and his buddy Gray Barker said there was a bunch of shenanigans going on at Point Pleasant, and he should go there and check it out. So he did. He went to the sheriff's office to get some leads, and they told him to go to Mary Hire, who was the reporter. Mary Hire says she knows a bunch of people who have had experiences, and that they'd probably be going to go out to the TNT area to to you know fuck around and see what's out there. And um. Another thing, audience and Carly, is that Keel lists the names of every single fucking person who's in this story. And all of these people have names except for the one unnamed in the beginning. But I'm taking the names out to kind of alleviate some of the, the confusion of the story. Um, but he says he tapes um, everyone's individual stories and they all line up, you know, because all of these people had previous experiences with UFOs and Mothman and Zaria. And they all line up. They all say the, roughly the same thing, you know. So they go out at around 9 p.m. There's three other people, including Keel, who decide to go into the TNT area, and a few others wait in the car. And they said they're all joking, they're having a laugh, they're shooting the shit, they're talking. And then one person screamed. Her name was Connie. She screamed and said, those eyes, he's there. So she, sh those eyes, he's there. She fucking breaks down. She goes absolutely bananas. She's sobbing uncontrollably. She was. She, Keel said she was stoic to a wreck in seconds. I saw those eyes, those two big eyes she managed to choke out. Keel went to investigate. He said he was scared, but he wasn't terrified. He said he didn't see anything. He looked around. Mary Heyer, who was with the rest of the group, said they saw something running from out beyond the edge of the plant. And everyone except Keel said that they heard a large, that sounded like a large piece of metal fell from the top of a building and smashed into the ground next to them. They all said that the atmosphere was thick, it was heavy, which is another thing you get with a lot of paranormal things. People say it, that it just feels funky around. And one of them said that they, they, their ears started bleeding, which would indicate a rapid change in atmospheric pressure. Um, Keel quotes, hold on. The group was now in a state bordering on sheer panic. I could see that their feelings were real. This was not some kind of act being staged for my benefit. I'm not no hero, but I did not share their fear. Miss Millette's bleeding ear was a sign of a concussion, meaning the air pressure had changed suddenly. Connie had apparently had a hallucinatory or psychic glimpse from those frightening eyes. The metallic clang could not have come from inside the building or would have hurt it too. It may have been associated with a sudden change in pressure, I scanned the black skies. There was not a star or light visible. So, not only is this thing doesn't have a head. It's not, I didn't say that it doesn't have a head. Okay. I'm, I'm saying that Most it's, people are mentioning that it doesn't have a head. No, no. It's it's not... I don't want it to say it appears to be headless because of the eyes are so noticeable that okay. it's just all you can see is the eyes. Okay. It has a weird head. He's a giant humanoid figure that doesn't have a wingspan long enough to pick up his body. He's... And he can change the atmospheric pressure. No, I'm not saying that he he did that himself. But you know how you watch fucking Ghost Adventures. They say, oh, it, it, feels, it feels evil in here. Yeah. You know when you just get the feeling that it feels weird? You're... I'm not... It's not the feeling of feeling weird. He's literally claiming that was there was a change in atmospheric pressure... Because of a woman's ears bleeding. He's not attributing that to Mothman. Okay, what else it, what well, else would it be? I don't know. Also, why was it mentioned if it's not? Did Mothman throw a piece of metal down too? What? He's just listing the things that happened. I honestly think this is something that, that validates Keel. Is because he is saying that this stuff, he did not notice this stuff. That this stuff was happening to other people. He did not say that I saw the Mothman. I, Connie said she saw the eyes. I looked over and I saw him too. He's saying that he did not see them. You know, he's with this group and all this group is having experiences. And he said that he did not have those experiences. Okay, here's, here's where I have a problem with a lot of these stories. Where it just, from what we know about science, and we know a fuck ton about science... This just doesn't make any sense. And I know that, like, pseudoscience and paranormal and, like, that means it's it's not supposed to make sense. 
I don't know. I just don't. The more and more you say, the more and more like less plausible it seems to me. We're gonna talk about boys again. So Keel was driving home, back from the event. He was on an isolated back road in West Virginia, kind of creepy. He said suddenly he was engulfed by fear while he was driving. He was just driving along, having a grand old time, listening to John Denver on the radio. He said he stepped on the gas as soon as that happened, and he got to a certain point in the road and it stopped. And he's like, hmm. He circles back around, does it again, drives through the same area, happens again. He feels fucking terrified when he's driving through. He pulls over, he gets out, he listens. He said it is absolutely silent. There's not a noise. And you know, when you go outside at night, you hear cicadas. And well, this is November, so there's not going to be cicadas. But you hear like the wind and cars. You said not it was, when it's snowing. It's like well, it's silent. Not, I'm just saying. There no, could, I agree it with could, you. But you still hear the, the, you know, you hear the snow. This is November, so it's cold. You hear like the... But some, not all nights are windy. I know. But you hear noises, ambient noises. He said it was silent. And he said it's the kind of silence that can wake you. I really like that quote because I like to sleep with a fan. <laughs> <laughs> he said he looked everywhere. He's like, what is causing us? He looked around. He didn't see anything. Then he started walking forward. He said he was perfectly calm until he took one too many steps. And then he was stuck with an unbelievable panic. And he wanted to absolutely bolt to the other side. He didn't. He maintained composure and he walked through to the other side and now he turned around and he's like, okay, now I got to go back to my car. And he physically could not take a step forward. He did not want to. He said he considered sleeping on the road, the freezing West Virginia, okay. November road. West Virginia is not that cold in the winter. Yes, it is. Not as cold as it is here. Well, it's still cold. It's November. And this brings me into, he came back the next day. He didn't say anything there. He also didn't, he went back to the TNT area to look around to see if Connie may have saw anything. And I get, I think this validates Keel. He did not see anything that could have caused it. He, I want to talk about this feeling of what I wrote, what I'm coining as true fear. <laughs> You're coining that Yeah, term? I'm coining that. Okay, that's never been said before. Afraid of the Dark podcast approved, stamped, sealed, and shipped the idea of true fear. Yeah. I've told you that one day I was just driving home. I got off an exit, an unnamed exit in an unnamed northeastern state off a highway that I fucking hate. And I saw, I don't know what I saw on the side of the road, but I just, I, I felt immensely fucking afraid. And it was just like something just on the side of the road. You know, mm -hmm. also in my house, I remember one morning I was getting ready for school. It was probably 530 in the morning and I was brushing my teeth and I turned around to look in my hallway. I don't live in this house anymore, but I looked in the hallway near my parents' room and I just had a flash in my head of like a, like a fucking thing that yeah. was in that hallway. Yeah. And I was absolutely, and it was like a flash. It was literally like an image in my head, something I was not thinking of. I turned around and I saw this image on this thing and it absolutely scared the shit out of me i could not move i was fucking frozen in place with my toothbrush in my mouth like it was a fucking cartoon i just spit all over you i'm sorry it's okay i want to know if you've ever had this one i mean yeah i think everyone has this feeling but i mean this happens to me a lot it's just because like i have bad eyesight Especially during the dark and like when it's dark in my room and like I'll turn and I'll like, I there was a chair in my room with a bunch of clothes on it when I was younger and I always thought it was a person in the middle well, of the Well, I think there is a difference between I get scared and then you have a feeling, which makes me think, I don't know if you've ever experienced it because I think that people who have experienced it know it's impossible to explain. It's literally a freezing fear. Yeah. I think that this is a, we it's the fight or flight response. You know what I mean? Like you guys are describing something that's like biological. Who's you guys? Like, <laughs> like the argument of this like dread, you know, I, it, your, it is your body reacts extremely quick to these things because back in the, the olden days when you were 
a caveman and you needed to hunt and gather your food, you needed to act extremely quickly in these events, um, especially in times of danger. I understand that. And I have felt that feeling before. And I have felt this feeling before. And to me, they are different. I have different can, ideas of those two feelings. Okay. It could still be a biological response. So Woody went to NASA. Woody was invited to NASA by a man named Charlie. He said he was the head of NASA, and he was not. The person who was the head of NASA in 1966, the name was not Charlie. But he, Keel said that he invited Woody and his family not Keel, the head of NASA named Charlie, in quotations, um, went to Cape Kennedy on the weekends, and every night Woody was separated from his family to a room on the Cape to be interrogated about every last deal, detail regarding Indrid Cole. Um, they said at the end of the week, his interrogators showed him a star map and pointed to a speck on it, telling him that is where they are from. They said they had interviewed several other contactees, all with a story similar to his own. And when he asked why they didn't release their UFO information to the public, they allegedly replied that it would only cause panic. Women would commit suicide, women would commit suicide, throw babies out of the window, and this kind of panic would sweep the world. Who said this? The head of NASA, Charlie, who is not the head of NASA. He's only <laughs> known as Charlie. Um, Derringer said that he brought home a flock of souvenirs as proof of his trips. He had photographs. He had scraps of um, materials. He had all these souvenirs. So he did go to NASA, Cape Kennedy. Doesn't mean he was invited there. So how is he going to get pictures from inside of a government organization? Don't they have, like, tours there? now at, like, stations? I'm sure they do. But this was, again, 67. The rocket launch was 69. So this was before... Just saying. Guy's name was not Charlie. So he made up this fake dude? He didn't make anybody up. He said somebody invited him. The guy made a name up. He said my name was Charlie. It wasn't his name. It might have been his name, he, but he claimed that he was the head of NASA. He wasn't. Also, I think that's an overstatement. I don't think people would throw their children out the window. <laughs> well, it's the idea that God is not real. You know? How does this disprove aliens God? Aliens being real, I feel like, would prove that religion is bullshit. I don't think so. I think because it would prove that there are we are not God's special creation. You know, we are not made from well, God. Well, couldn't we it are be just like another cog in the the, the astrological machine? You obviously know both you and I know that a in terms of Christianity, I think the church can spin it in a way that's oh absolutely. Yeah, I don't think absolutely. it would cause a mass outrage. I like think you it think, would. I don't think so. You don't think if 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 if. The U.S. government came up tomorrow and said, hey, aliens are real. I think most Here's people, proof. in today's day and age, I don't think it would cause an outrage. I, I think do. Most people, I absolutely do. I think most people believe that there are aliens to an extent. Maybe it's bacteria, like I think, or it well, could be. aliens to an extent versus there are aliens on this planet. And we have proof of it, and we've been hiding it for 80 years. Yeah, I don't think so. You don't think it would cause this area? No, I don't think that's what I think have. it would cause no. a societal fucking breakdown. I don't think so. <laughs> I, get, I don't think I, you're giving people enough credit. Like, this is, this is how I'm I would... I'm not giving people no, enough credit? be quiet. This is how I would react. Oh, that's weird. And then move Are on to my life. Are you fucking serious? Yeah. If the government said that aliens were real yeah you wouldn't be phased by it that no. they were on this planet no and that all of those stories you heard were real yep that happened yep they abduct cows yep they carve holes in their ass okay yep, but that, that happened just because they say that aliens are here on earth doesn't mean that all the stories from the past are real 
Roswell was real. All this shit was real. Battle for fucking what was the the Manhattan fucking lights were real. All that shit. Those were those are beings from another planet. We lied to you saying these are real. That you wouldn't be. You'd be like, oh. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, that's cool. That is a you as long, are, listen, that is a one of a kind opinion. Because from you. As, as long as it doesn't impact me or anyone else, then I'm it fine. It everybody. It obviously it would. That would change the way we look at so much shit. You don't think so? No. Well, obviously, like their presence being here isn't impacting a a, a large amount of people. If they're what if All they're right, like? Let's move on. Listen, if they have, like, cool science where they can, like, cure disease, that's fun. They can stay. Yeah, what if they want to fucking kill you? If they wanted to kill me, they would have done it already. So people have been seeing Men in Black everywhere. What is a Men in Black? Will Smith. No. With the little light thingy where they flash in front of your eyes. No. Men in Black. The best way I could describe it is their Uncanny Valley. You know what that means? Yeah. When you look at something that looks human, but it's just weird. Like the Polar Express. Yeah, exactly. Like that little fucker from the Polar Express. Um, dark skin, big eyes. Like they're actively trying to be a human, but they don't know how to be a human. Sounds like me. Yeah, exactly like you. Palms like this. To your armpits. This is a way that some people cross their arms. I've seen a lot of people do that. People usually cross their armpits. I have seen old men do this. Old men. They're fucking men in black. Um, like they're they're in outfits from the wrong time. They're in cars from the wrong time. They always they ask for the time. They don't speak correctly. Like they're trying. Like they got a crash course. They watched a fucking Hank Green crash course on becoming a human in space. Hank Blue. From, from Nebulon 33. So two men, in fact, came into Mary Hire's office to ask her about the UFO reports. They, she said that they had dark complexions, they looked like twins, and when they asked about, is there any UFOs, she brought out a folder and saying she'd been keeping all the UFO sightings in, in here, and they, she handed it to them. She went back to work, they handed it right back to her. They said, has anyone ever asked you to stop reporting on these? And she shook her head. She said, no. And she said, and they said, well, what if someone demanded you to stop reporting on these things? And she said, well, I'll tell them to go to hell. And she went back to her work. She looked up there going, strange. Not paranormal, but strange. And there are a ton of stories like this in the book. Like I said, the book about halfway through gets kind of off topic and there are literally, there's probably a hundred stories about orbs and UFOs and men in black and stop making that face at me. But here's one of the most notable ones and this story transcends the story of the Mothman. This is, happens on January 6th, 1967. Edward Christensen and his family and his new house had no numbers in the phone book. At 5.30 p.m., there was a knock on the door. We're adding sound effects now. You've been adding sound effects this entire... The sh- the, what, uh, May, uh, Edward Christensen's wife goes up to the door and he goes, Honey, who is it? And she says, Well, it's the strangest man I've ever seen. And they open the door. The man asks for Edward Christensen by name. He claims he's from the Missing Heirs Bureau and says Edward may have inherited a great deal of money. He just asks, has to ad- ask Ed, a few questions first. Ed denies it at first, says, I don't fucking know anybody who died. But after some convincing, he says, all right, you can come in. Just for a little bit. They said they then realized how big this guy was. Ed was a big guy. He was 6'2", but he was towering over Ed. So he had to be at least six and a half, you know, seven feet tall. They said he was wearing a Yushanka. You know what that is? No. The Russian hair hats. Oh. It's like a raccoon. Interesting. He's wearing a shanka and a coat that was too thin for January 6th. So he's probably wearing a little light jacket. Okay. It, my defense to that, you wear shorts year round. I do. I so. do. Because I am a big guy and we do get hot. Yeah. He said, this will only take 40 minutes. Edward, and he prefaces with, you might be the guy we're looking for. You might be the heir to a bunch of money. You might. Might not be. 
He sits down, and the family notices that her his pants were too short. He was wearing high waters, and that the soles of his shoes were unusually thick, and that he had a green wire running from the pant leg down to his socks. He introduces himself as something very plain, but said that his friends gave him the nickname Titan. They asked him if he wanted any food. He said no, but he do want a glass of water in 10 minutes. He then asked his wife, Ed and his wife, a million questions like how many cars did the family have? What was the street they grew up on? Um, any scars? If so, where are they? How big are they? In what shape are they? Scars? Scars or birthmarks. And what schools they both went to when they were kids. Kids information, the same thing. So he asked a bunch of weird questions that really wouldn't be um, contingent to uh, missing air. When he was asking the questions, they noticed that he was getting red, like he was about to pass out, like he was holding his breath. And exactly 10 minutes, exactly 10 minutes passed, and he asked for the glass of water. He took a giant yellow pill. He took it, sipped the water, and then he went back to normal. He stopped being red. All his skin flushed back out. Precisely 40 minutes later, precisely, he got up, walked out, and the family said that his shoes were squishing, like they were sopping wet as he walked out. The wife watched him go outside. He said that he raised his hand to signal for a car. The black Cadillac pulled up, no lights, got on, drove out. A few weeks later, um, someone called them, said they had found the Edward Christensen they were looking for, and they will be receiving no money. And then Keel interviewed each member of the family separately, and they all had the same story. Mm-hmm. So what do you think of that? Maybe he was just a fun guy. A fun guy? Yeah. And tiny? Tiny. What do, we, what do you think about the wire? Maybe he... Mm, maybe he had a tape recorder or something. What about squishy shoes? I don't know. Maybe he had a... He was sweaty. What about the pill? The pill? Yeah. What pill? I, you weren't listening. I said he <laughs> took a pill. He asked for a glass of water. Okay. Tylenol? A giant yellow fucking Tylenol? I don't fucking know. It was the 60s. Maybe he, took, he was dropping some acid or something. To keep the interviews interesting. There were... Dozens, if not hundreds, of sightings like this in this time, in Point Pleasant at this time. Mary Heyer saw them, John Keel saw them, everybody in this area saw these things. To whom it may concern, yep. I, Mrs. Mary Heyer of 219th 6th Street, Point Pleasant, West Virginia, Why she reporter a full address? for the Athens, Ohio Messenger, hereby swear that I was present at the following event and personally witnessed it as described. On the evening of April 6th, 1967, I accompanied Mr. John A. Keel of New York City to an isolated hilltop on Five Mile Creek, south of Gallipolis Ferry, West Virginia, shortly after 11 p.m. I observed a pale red object of undetermined size moving in a controlled manner slightly above treetop level over a hill about 500 yards from our position. There are no houses or roads on that hill. The object appeared to move cautiously and slowly through the sky to the far end of the sloping field, the lights flickering on and off in an irregular pattern. As the object grew closer, Mr. Keel got out of the car and flashed a powerful flashlight directly at it three times. The object immediately returned the signal by flashing a brilliant white light three times. Then it rose upwards and the pale light went completely out. Signed, Mary Heyer. I personally appeared before my office, county and state, Mary Heyer, known to me personally and acknowledged the above statement to be true and personally signed her signature in my presence. Given under my hand this day, 21st of June, 1967, my commission expires June 12th, 1977, Howard Schultz, notary public. Mary Heyer and John Keel were fucking with the orbs and they appeared to be sentient. Meaning that you could flash your light at them and they'd flash right back at you. They knew that you were doing it to them. 
Well, they didn't know they maybe det- just because something like cat gives a response doesn't mean they're consciously thinking about it. They, whatever this was was responding to stimulus. Yeah, doesn't mean it's so much so that Mary Heyer legally made an affidavit to say that this happened. She put her name in legal ink yep. on this. Something was fucking around. What do you got to say about that, liberal? Science lover. Oh, my science. You don't love science? I love science. I love this shit. This is, well, this is not science. It's pseudoscience. So, what happened after this? I said, I'm not going to go into it, because there's a lot of, it's name spaghetti. It's story spaghetti. A lot of overlapping shit. Um... There's a lot of telephone calls. We're beginning to watch. My girlfriend here has never seen Stranger Things. It's been out for about six years now. And we're both watching it. I watched the third episode today. She picks up the phone, shocks her head. That kind of shit was going on here. Lines were cutting. They said they heard the breathing over the lines. There's orbs everywhere. There was people calling Keel. They said that Gray Barker wanted to speak to Keel and to call him back at this number, and then they recited a number that was just John Keel's number, and it was different by one digit. And John Keel knew Gray Barker's phone number. They were friends. Men in black everywhere. Orbs everywhere. There was just shit going fucking bananas, B-A-N-A-N-A-S. Okay, Gwen Stefani. Miss Virginia Thomas was in her house which was beside the TNT area when she heard a loud squeaking noise, anything unlike anything she had ever heard before in her many years living in that house. Quote, the best way I could describe it, she told Miss Heyer and me, is that it was like a bad fan belt, but much louder. I stepped outside. It seemed to be coming from one of the igloos, and I saw a huge shadow spreading across the grass. It was just after noon, so there shouldn't have been any shadow like that. Then this figure appeared. It walked erect, <laughs> like a man, but it was all gray, and it could be much bigger than man, any man I ever saw. It moved fast across the field and disappeared in the trees. It didn't seem to be walking exactly. It was almost gliding, faster than any man could run. Everyone said they've been plagued by bad dreams since early November 1967. They said they've been seeing weird people everywhere in the TNT area, men in black types, everywhere preceding this event. Hire was having bad dreams and she was picking up from Keel from the airport because he was investigating something in South Carolina. Hire had said everyone had been feeling very uneasy and like something bad was going to happen. Like they, they got a feeling of, of misfortune. Keel admits that it might have been Miss Hire's suggestion, which I again think validates Keel, but he said that he felt the same thing. Hire said, up until this point, it was relatively quiet, but as soon as John came back, all hell broke loose. The bridge collapsed 13 months to the day. And November 15th was the first sighting of the Mothman, or was the first interaction with the Mothman. December 15th was the day it collapsed. An error with the traffic light um, had caused the bridge to, like, the bridge had a traffic light on it, and it was just red, like it wasn't allowing any cars to pass, like it normally did. And there was a tenth of an inch of crack in one of the metal beams. And because of the error with the traffic light, there was too much weight for the bridge. It collapsed again, killing 46 people in 10 days before Christmas. And that's the end of the story. That's it? That's it. I'll give you some where are they nows. Uh, Woody divorced his wife and married a, another, uh, Keel says, much younger woman. And they moved away. To live to another state, never to be heard from again. Many people in Point Pleasant um, had to be admitted to the psych ward because they were suffering from nervous breakdowns, insomnia, and all that shit. Uh, a lot of them committed suicide. And many of the people directly involved in the event, like Edward Christensen, not Edward Christensen, but like Connie, like I had mentioned in the story, they didn't live to see the 10 month anniversary or 10 year anniversary of this event. They all died. And they weren't old. They were in their 30s and 40s, and they died before the 10-year anniversary of this event. Do we have, like, medical records of this? Like, can I look? I'm sure you could. I could probably Google Mary Hire obituary and see what she died and what she died from. Who's writing these, like, where are the now statements? Like, well, where is this? But where is this information this coming from? This is in the book. Okay. 
this is the last paragraph of the Mothman prophecies, and I think it's pretty cool. After spending a lifetime in Egyptian tombs among the crumbling temples of India in the Lama series of the Himalayas, endless nights in cemeteries, gravel pits, and hilltops everywhere, I have seen much, and my childish sense of wonder remains unshaken. But Charles Fort's question always haunts me. If there is a universal mind, must it be sane? Yay. Yay. All right, so let's talk about it. Okay. The idea of a tulpa. If you know what a tulpa is, trick question. You do, because this is our second time recording this. Um, tulpas, audience, I did find a quote. In contemporary paranormal discourse, a tulpa is a being that begins in the imagination but acquires a tangible reality and sentience. Topos are created either through a deliberate act of individual will or unintentional from the thoughts of numerous people. And this is from a research article entitled Tracking the Topa, Exploring the Tibetan Origins of a Contemporary Paranormal Idea. From PNAS. Was this actually from PNAS? No, it's not from PNAS, but it is from a site like that. It was a research article. You could look that up. So it was probably describing what it was, not saying that it's real. Well, it's the idea of it. All of this isn't scientifically real. It's the idea you can, It's the idea of thinking I, something into existence. I understand that. They're probably explaining what it is in the yeah, article. That's the yeah, quote. that's Is the Mothman a thought being? I think there's way too much stuff going on. I don't want, okay, again, I'm not discrediting the victims themselves or the people that experienced this. I think it's inherently extremely sad that a lot of people died on the bridge and I am sending my condolences to their families and the people that committed suicide and everything like that. I think that's extremely tragic and I don't want to bring down like the tragedy of this. I just think there's so much going on where it just doesn't make sense. Where there's like people wearing Russian hats and he has squishy shoes. And then there's a, a Mothman dude that just shoots into the sky. They need to like pick a narrative. Well, doesn't that add validation to the story though? I don't if know. All these people are seeing shit that's not... Wouldn't you think that, oh, I saw a different Mothman. It was, it was Moth Woman. And she had a bow tie on. I understand what you're saying. And she has just, boobies. Oh my gosh. I understand what you're saying. It's just like, why why does this thing exist and why are these like alien people trying to contain it? Are they from the same universe? Like, So you think that's what you think? Or that's what it sounds like to you? Is yeah, that these that's people what it are sounds like to me. Searching for Mothman? Yeah. Interesting. That was one of the points I wanted to make. Was that they're... Okay, so that is one idea. The second thing that we're going to talk about, and I know it's not a hypothesis, but it's my sixth grade in version of hypothesis, which is an if-then statement, which is the extraterrestrial hypothesis, which is if aliens are real, then they are piloted, or excuse me, if spaceships are real, UFOs are real, then aliens pilot them. Aliens being organic creatures pilot spaceships john keel did not agree with this he thought that like you said earlier that aliens were some sort of being that our brain cannot comprehend yeah. so it make either they present themselves in a way that we can understand or we see them in a way that our brains can understand does that make sense yeah so is is Indrid Cold a alien that is projecting a form onto our brain that we can understand? Are these men in black trying to be things that we can understand? Do you know what I'm saying? They're trying to be human. So they have all these, these human-like, human-adjacent mannerisms, like taking your hands and folding them in an un uncomfortable way, or speaking in a monotone voice and wearing clothes that are just out of date. They're human adjacent mannerisms that they're pro pro projecting onto our brain so that they can understand. That's what Keel thought. Yeah. 
but he s- admits that he did not understand the point of what happened. Yeah. That all this stuff happened, but he doesn't know why the fuck it happened. I think that that is the most likely. I think that there is there's some. Before you go on, uh, I do want to briefly explain because I am the science person here. A hypothesis is a testable statement in which you form a prediction from in terms of experimentation. Alternatively, as my sixth grade teacher taught me, a hypothesis is an if-then statement. If something happens, then you can do something Yeah, a hypothesis has to be testable within the realms of the scientific field. No, I did not invent that word. We have, audience, we have argued about this for a while. Yeah, I have a degree in biology, I and don't he give a does fuck not. What you so. have. Yeah, it is May, it is April 29th, the, the day of this recording. You don't have a fucking degree yet. Fine. You still got in a few five, more days. Five days. So we're both in the same fucking playing field right now, if then. Okay. Let's see. Any other closing thoughts? Was Mothman the harbinger of destruction? No, I don't, like. What, did, what connection did the, when these moths have to this bridge? What connection did these moths have to this bridge? Was Mothman the harbinger of destruction? No. Why? I think it's just an unfortunate unfortunate co- coincidence of events. I I know, like, because I don't have an explanation, it sounds like this has to be real. <gasps> but there's so much stuff where, like, we don't know, and there's so many assumptions that we have to make where, like, I honestly can't give you my like my true thoughts on it because i have to assume and that is i think that ultimately i as much as i poke fun at you i can't either yeah i don't know this is just the story i can give you i can say that human brains the way that we are now like within the last couple thousands of years they're primed and shaped for us to over perceive events and for us to be constantly anxious and feel this anxiety and fear and death so we can avoid like dangerous situations we evolved to be that way and that's a fact we see thing we provide way too much meaning to things that don't have meaning and these are cognitive anthropological tested hypotheses and theories um promiscuous teleology that's a fake pareidolia all of these rubisco (laughs) All of these explain that humans constantly over-perceive. And that was to our benefit in the past, but now it's to our detriment. I understand what you're saying. Yeah. I understand what you're saying. And that is going to be a common thread with literally everything we talk about. No, I understand that. I think humans also use stories to come together. I agree. That's what we're doing right now. Yeah. That's what the point of this podcast is. So... There's no... I don't know. Yeah, I don't have a full explanation. Let's shake on it. I don't know. Shake my hand. <laughs> okay. I don't know. Shaking it. I don't know. I am I still am very, very heavily skeptical just because of everything that's going on. And there's a lot of hearsay. There's... It's not... You're not in an environment that's controllable. Like, you can't... You're not... And also, memory is inherently fallible. I agree with you. So, there's just a lot going on here. And I, again, don't want to take anything away from the people that lost their lives or were heavily affected by this and had to seek psychiatric treatment because that really stinks. Sexy psychiatric treatment. Though. Yeah. So. Not good. Lobotomy. Honestly, all right. Honestly, like, it could have been something that was, like, heavily treatable today, like anxiety or depression. And, unfortunately, they had to go to a psychiatric hospital probably was yeah anyway that was our first episode the mothman and i want to thank not only carly for again supporting me and everything i do but i want to thank the audience and i hope that this blossoms into a beautiful flower because i really enjoyed doing this and i'm enjoying preparing the next episode which you can find by going to at aottpod on instagram and following us there we have the schedule of our first three episodes the fourth episode is with another co-host um i'm not sure if carly guest guest alternative co-host 
Oh my god, my job's which, already taken from which, me. Which Carly can be on if she wants to, but... I think not everyone does not want to hear me drone on about science. Yeah, say that again. Anyway, yeah, we have a more fun co-host coming in a couple... <laughs> oh, you're <laughs> such an asshole. Um, but I, I sincerely thank anyone for listening, and I thank Carly for, for joining me tonight. And again, if you want to see the next episode, it's going to be a doozy. It's going to be more fun than this one. Not as much death. A little more sexual harassment, though. Okay. Not as fun, either. Not fun. Also, I will be speaking and debunking the theory of aliens and pyramids, and I love Egyptian mythology, so this I think be... it's pretty common common knowledge that aliens involve the pyramids. No. Okay. I want to do an episode okay. of that. And then so Carla's going to do a few I... episodes by herself. Yeah. And I also have a, a, maybe a little side series that I'm thinking about doing about... Some more recent historical events, but you're gonna have to check in next time when I'm not as tired. But anyway, yes. thank also, you. Also, you can find us anywhere that you get your and consume yes. your podcasts. podcasts Spotify, Apple, iHeart, Amazon, Google, other ones. HBO Max, no, not Netflix, HBO. The show. Disney we're, Plus. we're going on tour. We're Moon going, Knight. We're going on tour. We're going to. Uh, Minneapolis, we're going to Kansas City, we're going to Tennessee. All right. Thank All right. you, everyone. Thank you. And I'm sorry that I'm such a downer, but I really, truly love science. You don't have to apologize. Everything it's okay. that has to do with science, and I will stay true I to that I fucking forever. love science. IFLS. I have a Facebook. sticker on my laptop that says Science Rules with Bill Nye. You also have a sticker that says, Jarvis is my co-pilot. Yeah, I love the Avengers. Jeff Goldblum is a sunflower. Yeah, Jeff Goldblum is cool. Thank you for listening and Thank you. check us next week again at AOTV Pod. Enjoy your May. May the fourth be with you. <laughs>